been great. Uh, first, I want to thank the street cred organizers and Cummings School of Medicine and all the other hosts that helped put this organization together. Thank you, Mr. Young, for getting us started on the right foot, and Bonnie for the kind and somewhat exaggerated uh, introduction. Greatly appreciated. I, I'm a so as she said, I'm, I'm from Saskatchewan. I'm, I'm a farm boy from the south of the province, but I now work in an inner city clinic in Saskatoon. Now, some of you who braved the Calgary traffic to get here might say inner city Saskatoon, right? <laughs> and it's true, we're a much smaller place, but the reality is we do have a city that is divided, and on our west side, is in what we call the core neighborhoods, there, there is a, a large low-income population, and Many of the same challenges you see in much larger cities are faced there as well. And that's where I live. That's where I work. And, and I enjoy being there quite a bit. There's something special about it. On my way to work, people say hi. It's friendly. It's informal. They say, hey, Doc. Hey, Miley. How are you doing today? And uh, it's really a, a very pleasant place to be in many ways. But it also can be a pretty hard place to be in other ways. On that same walk to work, I often see a a young woman that I'll call Crystal. It's not a real name, of course, but Crystal is, a, is somebody that every time I see her, it makes my day and it breaks my heart. It makes my day because she's hilarious. Uh, she always makes fun of whatever I'm wearing, and which I mean, with good reason, but uh, great sense of humor, big smile, but it also breaks my heart because I see her there on the corner and not in the clinic. And I really should be seeing her in the clinic because the fact is Crystal is quite sick. She has HIV, which is disastrously common in my neighborhood. We have over 400 patients at my clinic. Our rate of incidence of new cases of HIV in Saskatoon is triple the national average. And her CD4 count is under 50, which means that she's not able to fight infections well. It should be at least 200, and, and you know, most of us would have a CD4 count of about 1,000. So she should be coming to see me and, and being on medications to help build up her immune system and protect her. But she really only shows up if she has a pneumonia or another acute infection because she's not really ready to take medications every day. And on some level, that's really reasonable because... It's not really HIV that she's sick with. She's really sick with poverty. She's sick with not having finished her education, with never having lived anywhere safe and stable, really, never having had regular access to healthy food, having been abused as a child, and being part of a population that has been marginalized and abused for generations through residential schools and other forms of colonization. So, you know, we know what to do about the virus that's get making her sick right now. But to really help her, we need much more than doctors and pharmacies. We need to make sure she's got enough money to live. We need to make sure that she's got support to deal with the addictions that have emerged from the trauma she's experienced. We need to make sure she's got a safe place to stay. When we look at that, when we recognize the, the difference between the effects of healthcare and what really makes us sick or well, we're talking about something called the social determinants of health. This idea that what really makes a difference is how much money you make, how far you went in school, the first thousand days of your life, that early childhood development, where you live, what kind of housing, what kind of environment, what kind of employment you had. Another way of looking at that is a story that I like to tell. Imagine for a minute that you're standing at the edge of a river and you see a kid floating in the river, drowning. And you're a brave person, so you tear off your shoes and you dive in the water and you swim out and you, you haul that kid to shore, which is great, it's wonderful, you saved a life. But then along comes another kid. You're not even dry yet and already you're jumping back in to save another kid. You bring that one to shore and then you see another and another, and another. You're calling everybody you know to come help haul kids out of the river. Eventually, hopefully, one of you will get smart enough to say, who keeps chucking these kids in the river? And you'll go upstream to try and find out 
I'm going to try and change it. That story, whether the story of Crystal or the story of the kids in the river, really illustrate the tension that I think, that I feel and I think many people in frontline practice feel, which is a frustration and a happiness. Uh, I am very happy to be a family doctor. I love the fact that when I, when I was wanting to get into medicine, I used to tell myself I was going to make friends all day, which sounds ridiculously naive and is exactly what I do. You know, <laughs> It's great. People come in, they tell me their story, I try and help, we make a connection. It's wonderful. But at the same time, it's super frustrating because with some medications or advice or a referral to someone smarter than me, I can help a little bit. But really, I can do very little to change the conditions that made them ill in the first place and to which I will send them once again, once we're done our visit. If we really want to improve the health of people like Crystal, we need not just change in how we practice medicine, we need social change. But that social change is only possible if it's seen to be possible by the public. And what's seen to be possible by the public is greatly determined by what we call frames. So the, the terms of the argument of the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here and use an example to share how frames work. Uh, Darren Dick is the guy up in the top right-hand corner. He was my roommate in, in Saskatoon for many years. He's now a professor at Ambrose University. And he believes in zombies. He's quite obsessed with zombies. And when we lived together, it was terrible. I, I never let him have shotguns in the house, but you know, there were bars on the windows and everything was always locked. And I would just, you know, I'd poke holes in his plan. They're going to get in through the garage. They're going to tunnel up in your room. <laughs> but you know, I'd already lost the argument because I don't even believe in zombies. I don't. And, but I'd already lost the argument because I'd accepted his frame. I'd argued about the zombies instead of saying, stop talking about nonsense. And we do that all the time. We see people arguing, saying, well, I've got this plan for the economy. And the response is, okay, but your plan stinks, rather than, well, maybe the economy isn't actually the most important thing. Maybe we should be thinking about a plan for our health and how we use the economy to achieve that. Current frames, like economy is the most important thing, or austerity, this idea that we, we can't have nice things, that we need to diminish our expectations. These are limiting what's possible and limiting the, the ability to really improve our health. So what I've been proposing through the Healthy Society book and through Upstream is this idea of a new frame and of health as that frame. And I pick health for a few reasons. One, because it's something we all care about. Our language is full of references to healthy debate, healthy rela relationships. We toast to each other's health. And that's reflected in the polls, always at or near the top of the issues important to Canadians is health care, which again, it's not health, but it's a good surrogate for how important it is in our lives. It's what we want, and it's also what's good for us. If you take the World Health Organization definition, not just the absence of illness, but full physical, social, and mental well-being, think of that as a motto for your province or your country. Wouldn't we be proud to be Canadians who are working to achieve full physical, social, and mental well-being for everyone in the country? So it gives us a destination we care about and that matters, that's meaningful. But we also know how to get there. Back to that list of the social determinants of health, income, education, housing, employment, nutrition, the wider environment. Those are the things of public policy. They map onto departments, <coughs> ministries. We know where to invest if we want a healthy, equitable society. Which also, I think, provides a, a really inspiring possibility, which is that we could move beyond making political decisions based on ideology, what's popular in the polls, and really be judging based on the evidence. Is what we're doing going to improve? Is it improving health outcomes or isn't it? And we change course based on whether or not we're successful. Really shifting into a more evidence-based approach, which we've tried to do, seen happen in medicine, to, I think, some uh, sizable improvements. But you know, at sometimes politics in Canada has, seen, has seemed know, anti-evidence uh, at the extreme and, and at the minimum not sufficiently integrating the knowledge that we have available to us. So in order to make that shift, in order to change the frame, it's going to take some effort. That doesn't happen overnight. You don't change a landscape overnight. 
maybe it takes a stream to change a landscape. And so we're, we've started something called Upstream. Um, upstream is really a, a movement to build a healthy society through evidence-based, people-centered ideas. It's naming something that's happening already across the country, more and more people thinking this way. And what we've done is established a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's dedicated to supporting that movement and building our, our momentum towards a healthier society. A couple of things we've done in our couple short years of existence. One is run a, a campaign called Poverty Costs that resulted in the establishment of a poverty reduction strategy in our home province of Saskatchewan. But we have a national focus. And during the federal election, we ran a campaign that was quite well watched and shared called Vote for Health, encouraging people to look through the platforms at the issues that would make the biggest difference in health outcomes. And now we're in a moment that's different. Again, we're nonpartisan, but it would be dishonest to not notice what was happening the last several years, that we had a government that wasn't interested in health equity, and that now there's a window, there is a change. We don't know exactly what it will mean, but there's, there's some hope there. I was given hope by Prime Minister Trudeau sending the mandate letters to his ministers that talked about a national poverty strategy, national housing strategy, reinstating the refugee health care that was cut in 2012, and even just simple things like letting scientists and charities say what they really want to say. That to me is exciting. We don't know, you know the, the proof is in the pudding, but it's, it's encouraging. And I think it should embolden us to ask for those things and even more. And one of the things I'd like to encourage us to ask for is something called health in all policies. Health in all policies is a model that emerged initially in Finland in the 70s and 80s, spread throughout those wonderful Nordic countries, and then has slowly dissipated throughout Europe, some jurisdictions in the States, even Quebec has a, a similar law, but it's, it's an approach to governance that says health is what we're really trying to achieve. And it's what we're trying to achieve, not just in the Ministry of Health, but in justice, in education, in the economy, that every ministry needs to look at their decisions and say, is what we're proposing to do going to improve or worsen health outcomes and pick the approach that will make the biggest difference. It seems almost so obvious that they should be doing it already. It seems so simple. But uh, on the other hand, it could be really quite revolutionary, quite a, a fundamental shift in the foundation of how we look at politics in our primary frame. Because it, it creates constraints. It means there are things we couldn't do anymore. We couldn't make political decisions that would harm Canadians, which, again, that seems to make a lot of sense, but isn't really a, a restraint that exists. But more importantly than any constraints, it opens up space, space for better decisions, space for better policies, social change, the kind of social change we'd need to improve the lives of Crystal and others. And I should give you an update on Crystal. Since I first started talking about her uh, and the experience uh, of seeing her on my way to work and, and how that was uh, distressing. She's gone through some pretty major changes because we had a Housing First program developed in Saskatoon that took the approach that we need to put people in housing and get them stable and then we work on addictions and mental health issues. And she's responded really well to that. She's in a safe place. She's now on the methadone program. And because with that program she's going to the pharmacy each day, She's also, also taking her antiretrovirals. And I see her more often in clinic than I do on my walk to work. Which is really encouraging. But we're a nation of pilot projects. And we need to scale things up. And there are hundreds and thousands of crystals and others struggling with health issues that are a result of their social circumstances. So we want that space. That space to see housing first spread across the country or to investigate something like basic income, where rather than giving people on social assistance the bare minimum that they can not survive, that they must scramble, you actually, when you file your taxes, if you make above a certain amount, you pay taxes. If you make below that amount, the amount you need to actually live in our society, you receive to be up to that amount so that we can actually help people get beyond that welfare wall, help them to thrive rather than insist on 
forcing them to struggle in poverty. Space for ideas like a living wage, where we work with businesses to make them understand and the public understand that when you pay people well, they stick around, they stay in your jobs that, that you want them to stay in, and there's more income being circulated in our communities so that businesses actually thrive, not to mention the support that gives for, for our tax base and the other social programs. Space for finally ending the ridiculous practice of having on-reserve education funded at 30% less than the rest of the country. To have that space, though, we need that new frame. We need a new frame where we stop seeing things like that, ideas like that as a cost, and start recognizing them for what they are and for what the economics really shows them to be, which is social investment that has a financial return, means we spend less in the long run, but more importantly, we have better lives. That's the road to a truly healthy society. So I hope you'll join me in looking upstream, thinking upstream, acting upstream, and in enjoying the, the rest of the speakers. I'm really excited to see Martin Olshinsky, who along with being one of our brightest minds is one of my oldest friends. Chris, I'm really excited to see what you have to say. It's the first time we've got a chance to meet, and uh, Dr. Gibson, I think, is going to really inspire us. And of course, uh, Canada's mayor. That's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you very much. It, it, we're not jealous of a lot of things. OK, we're jealous of your premier. No, no, now I'm getting partisan. Excuse me, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, but yes, definitely some envy going on. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.